Okay, so in this section we're going to talk about the pulmonary anatomy. So we're going to tar start by talking about the different airways of the lungs. And the first types of airways that we're going to talk about is uh, our, what's called the conducting airways. And the conducting areas mean, um, the word conducting just refers to the fact that they are airways that, um, that move the air from, um, from the outside and down into um, the lungs, but don't, um, but, but aren't really involved in the exchange of gases into and out of the bloodstream. Okay, so they're just conducting the air from one place to another place, and that would be opposed to the um, exchange airways. Exchange airways. And the exchange airways are the places where um, the alveoli and the small um, exchange bronchioles are called, um, otherwise, um, you know, the bronchioles that actually have just a few alveoli sticking off of them. Um, so they're t the terminal bronchioles. Um, and these would be the exchange airways where the um, O2 and CO2 are actually exchanged with the bloodstream. Now, the conducting airways are. Um, have are what's called anatomic dead space because they're not involved with um, the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So as in terms of the exchange of gases, they are dead space. They are um, areas that are not, not physiologically active. However, they are physiologically active in other ways. So as the air travels through um, through the nasopharynx or the oropharynx, depending on whether your mouth or nose breathing and travels down through the trachea into the bronchi and work their way down through the um, you know 20 uh, seven, 17 to 23 um, branches of the respiratory tree um, a few things happen the air is warmed okay so it goes from being you know if it's like a cold wintry day in Rochester it might start out at uh, 5 degrees Celsius and by the time it gets down to the alveoli it's you know 98 or I should say 37.0 degrees Celsius and this is very important obviously because you don't want 5 degree air um, connecting um, or you know directly across a very thin layer from the blood or you're going to rapidly cool your your entire um, the entire organism. Okay, so it warms the air and it humidifies it and it also provides uh, a barrier to pathogens. Now it's amazing to think of, about just how efficient it is. We have an open tube uh, from the outside environment which is filled with you know, little bacteria and viruses all the time. People are coughing and sneezing. We're, you know, wiping our noses with our fingers. Um, <clears throat> and so there's all sorts of bacteria and pathogens that work their way in. But what's amazing is um, it's very, very rare for bacteria to get all the way down into the respiratory airway down here. And we know that because it's actually a very rare event for you to get pneumonia. I think it's like two or three um, people per 100,000 healthy individuals that get pneumonia every year. So it's a very rare event. So it's amazing that we are breathing in and out 24-7 um, and we only get pneumonia, you know, maybe uh, on average once or twice in an entire lifetime. And this just um, speaks to how powerful a barrier that our respiratory, our um, conducting airways have. And we'll get into that um, a little bit more when we talk about the physiology of, um, in a few minutes. So um, a few things I want to call your attention to, just a little review of, of the anatomy. So we have the oropharynx and the nasopharynx up here. We have the trachea, uh, the trachea and the bronchi, and these are cart uh, cartilage, very, uh, these are tubes that are covered with thick layers of cartilage um, so they're very rigid and the cartilage becomes more and more sparse as you move your way through the respiratory tree. Interestingly enough there are no muscles on the trachea but there are muscles on the bronchioles as so sort of the the cartilage is sort of replaced by smooth muscles in a sense. 
Um, now, there are three major lobes to the lungs. They're divided by fissures. So there's a fissure here and a fissure here. Actually, there's three major lobes on the right side. There's only two lobes on the left side. So this is the right upper lobe. This is the right middle lobe. And this is the right lower lobe. Now, from the anterior view, the right lower the lower lobes look very small, but from the posterior view, they take up most of the lung. So the fissure at the top in the back is way up here. So we have a fissure. If you were looking posteriorly, we'd see a fissure, and the lower lobes would take up most of the posterior section. Okay, so we have the right upper lobe, right middle lobe, right lower lobe, um, left upper lobe, and the left lower lobe. <clears throat> and these are all divided by fissures. Okay, so now I wanted to talk about the different cell types that you will see lining the airways at different levels because um, the the lining of the airway changes from level to level. So here in the trach in the trachea and the large bronchi, um, we have a simple um, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So these are little epithelial cells and it's simple because it's just one single layer and it is but it's pseudostratified so it kind of almost looks like because of the way the cells are crowded together it almost looks like they form layers um, <clears throat> and they are ciliated so we have cilia here now I wanted you to note here um, again the um, trachea have these very thick cartilaginous rings that are surrounding the trachea and give the tube um, significant rigidity. Um, now also while we're talking about the cells, there's one group of cells that I want to make sure to call our attention to. Um, they are the goblet cells that are interspersed in between the pseudo, um, pseudo stratified columnar epithelium. Now these goblet cells are secreting large amounts of mucus. <clears throat> okay, so and the mucus is actually very significant and you can see a little picture of what's going on over here. Um, <clears throat> we have here we have the pseudo stratified columnar epithelium with these long cilia that look like hairs and we have a goblet cell that is just cranking out tons and tons of mucus. And there's so much mucus from so many different goblet cells that we actually get this thick blanket layer of mucus. So there's, in a healthy person's lungs, we have this blanket of mucus that is riding on these cilia and all constantly in motion moving up towards the oropharynx. So there really is no, um, there is not a millimeter of trachea or bronchi that is not covered by this mucus layer. So it is truly is a blanket and it's a blanket that's constantly in motion. So these cilia are always beating and they're beating in such a way that they're um, keeping the mucus flowing in in a specific direction. And I know it's disgusting to think about but we're actually creating and moving one liter of mucus per day into our oropharynx and we swallow it unconsciously. Okay, so most of it, we're not coughing it up, um, it's just draining into our, low, um, into our oropharynx and we're swallowing it without um, giving it a second thought. <clears throat> so, uh, in some diseases, um, people that smoke, for instance, have um, actually lose these cilia and at the same time they actually hypersecrete mucus so they end up with a thick thick layer of mucus but it doesn't move right so it's a thick layer of mucus that doesn't move by itself so this is why um, a lot of smokers will you know sort of wake up in the morning coughing and gagging on their mucus because the mucus that has been created over many many hours um, will just sort of be sitting static in their airways and they will have to work to cough it up. 
Um, and we'll talk about more about what smoking does to your um, uh, does to your airways um, further on. And uh, <clears throat> so, for those of you that are still smoking um, in the course, um, you'll have lots of motivation to stop. Anyway, so um, as we move down the airway um, and get move from the trachea and the and the main the main bronchi and down into the bronchioles, we get a change in the epithelial layer. So the um, columnar epithelium are starting to take more of a squarish shape rather than a rectangular, so they're, they're becoming um, more of a cuboidal shape. And they're still ciliated, and they're still um, <clears throat> There are still some goblet cells, but the goblet cells are being, the further you go down, they're being replaced by clara cells. So there is much less mucus down on the bronchioles, and um, the clara cells actually provide um, a defense role. They actually have phagocytic properties, so they can engulf um, pathogens, and they also have a role in surfactant production. And uh, although they're not the main uh, creators of surfactant, um, and they also um, appear to be the parent cells of the bronchiolar epithelium. So these clara cells actually um, have the ability to div divide, and they can either become another another clara cell, or they can become a uh, cuboidal epithelium, and they actually um, can generate um, the um, epithelial cells in the upper airway as well. Um, so now these, the epithelial cells are termin terminally di differentiated, so they can no longer divide, but the clara cells maintain the ability to divide, and they're, they're the cells that populate the rest of the epithelium. Okay, so as we go down, you can see the um, cells become even shorter and more cuboidal shaped. Um, and there are more clara cells and even fewer um, and there are even fewer goblet cells um, the further you go down. Now you can see also the um, the layer, the um, lamina propria, which is underneath the basement membrane, is also changing in character as we go. And here we, um, down in the bronchioles and the respiratory bronchioles, um, we start to see a um, fairly thick layer of um, of smooth muscle. Now, now we are down into the alveoli, and you can see the respiratory bronchioles have these little, like I was mentioning above, um, have these little outpouchings of alveoli in them, and then they end at a terminal bronchus, and there are these like sort of grape-like clusters of alveoli at the very end. Both of these are exchange airways. Everything above this is just a conducting airway. Okay. Now, the alveoli itself, there are two basic types of cells. There's the type 1 alveolar cells, and these are the flat, very thin, pancake-like cells um, that um, provide the primary surface area. So you can see it's very long and thin, pancake-like, with a thin nucleus in the middle, and here's the second one here. So they um, they are the they provide most of the surface area of the alveoli, and then there are type two alveolar cells, and these are actually larger cells, but they don't take up very much surface area, um, and these are responsible for they are the parent cells of the type one alveolar cells. So these, um, similar to the clara cells, um, can um, can divide again to create another type two alveolar cell or a type one alveolar cell. And type one alveolar cells are terminally differentiated, so they can no longer divide. Um, and also, the type one alveolar cells are responsible for making surfactant, and we will talk about the importance of surfactant a little bit further on.